almighty and everlasting God, whose will it is to restore all things to your beloved Son, whom you anointed priest forever and king of all creation. Grant that all the people of the earth, now divided by the power of sin, may be united under the glorious and gentle rule of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. But uh, today, I'd like to explore with you whose work matters with God from Colossians chapter 3, verses 22 to chapter 4, verse 1. As uh, to tell you a little bit about my family background, my uh, grandfather on my mother's side was a fisherman. That's the wiry gentleman on the left. And uh, he had a 70-foot schooner, which he sailed to the North Atlantic twice a year for fishing for cod. Uh, the little lady on his right is my grandmother, and uh, they were in a little fishing outport in Newfoundland, <clears throat> which is Canada's most eastern province. It was a fishing village you could only get to by boat. Uh, there was no electricity, no running water, no sewage, nothing. And my grandmother used to uh, grow some cabbages and something amazingly called uh, fish and brews, which was the way they served cod. Uh, this is a picture of a boat very similar to what my grandfather actually owned and sailed. He had no, uh, no engine and he had no radar. He had a compass and sails in the North Atlantic, so you can kind of imagine. My grandfather on my father's side was um, a baker in England, and his brother and he both had bakeries in Hadley, England. And uh, his brother actually was famous at Christmas because he baked a two-ton Christmas cake, uh, literally two tons. I have a picture of him on a stepladder high up uh, icing this amazing cake. So when my grandfather arrived in Toronto in 1902 with nine children and $20, uh, he got a job the next day in a bakery and eventually uh, bought a little bakery, uh, which uh, is now called, was called, I should say, Stephen's Bread and Cakes. Now, the horse-drawn van looks pretty good, actually. It's got a kind of beveled window, but the horse looks really mangy. I mean, it's really <laughs> mangy. And my dad would be driving this during the week, uh, delivering bread and cakes, and one day he said to himself, I'm not gonna do this for the rest of my life. Uh, so uh, he uh, decided to do study at night for his CGA and eventually got a job with a bank. My mother, actually growing up in this outport, learned how to survive. This is a picture of her as a younger woman, actually, um, when she's taking bread out of a wood-fired stove. I don't know how many of you have cooked on wood-fired stoves. Yes, you have. Wonderful. But she was a homemaker. Her work was a homemaker uh, ever since she married. Although she came to Toronto at 16 years of age to become a domestic in a home of a very famous Canadian who is a television anchor. And uh, once she was actually uh, flying to Florida where they had a condominium and beside him was this gentleman and she said, well, you're such and such. I won't mention his name. And he said, yes, I changed your diapers. <laughs> so uh, anyway, but my dad eventually became a president of a steel fabrication company. Uh, he's here on board a ship. And so our family has been a working family. Uh, even my niece, who has a mental illness, uh, is on a disability pension. Uh, she is actually working in the church, and she provides tea and coffee and and cupcakes like this wonderful building. <laughs> I was on the plane on Friday and uh, they said, what, what are you going to Richland to do? I said, well, I'm going to be speaking at a Lutheran church. They, they said, what's the name of it? I said, I, I think it's uh, Richland uh, Lutheran. Oh, that's the cupcake church. <laughs> so uh, I don't think those people had ever been <laughs> inside the building, but they sure knew it. But at any rate, I became a Christian in a kind of strange way. I was uh, baptized at 16 by immersion in a Baptist church, but I wasn't a believer. 
And that's not supposed to happen in a Baptist church. It could happen elsewhere, but uh, it's not supposed to happen. But I found myself in church services sitting right back in that corner over there, uh, spending the service, which I found was boring, uh, spending the service making drawings of various projects that I would be building. But my eye caught the newsletter of the church, which said young people meet at uh, 7 p.m. Sunday night. Uh, I hadn't been to Sunday school after 11 years of age. I'd never been to a youth group. I thought, ah, I'll try it. So I went to the room. It was the worst possible room. It had no windows. It had steam pipes. It was dirty. And there were a group of 10 young people sitting in a circle, and they had long, sad faces. I said, hi, I'm Paul Stevens, and I'm here to join your group. They said, that's too bad. <laughs> I said, why is it too bad? They said, it's our last meeting. I said, why is it your last meeting? They said, we can't find anybody to be president. Then they looked at me. <laughs> they said, if you're willing to be president, we'll keep meeting. I said, it's a deal. So I took over the group. And it was a church group. I thought they should be studying the Bible and praying. So I organized. I'm an organizer. I organized uh, prayer meetings and Bible studies, including a prayer retreat at a camp in uh, northern Ontario. Ontario, by the way, is a province in Canada. It's not a city in California, okay? <laughs> so anyway, uh, we hired a, a pastor to speak, and the only thing I can remember his saying was a lie. He said God had called him to be a missionary at 16 years of age. He said, I refused to go, so God made it so I could never go. By making me have a motorcycle accident, my left leg is mangled, I'm lame, no mission board will take me and now I'm doomed to do God's second best, which is to be a pastor. <laughs> sorry, Steve and Corey, sorry. <laughs> so, uh, I'm so glad I was not converted to that man's God. But that night, God crossed the infinity of time and space and knocked on the door of my heart. And the next morning I woke up, uh, I just felt love the love of God. The next morning I woke up and I said, your president got saved last night, which created no small stir. <laughs> now the work world of the Apostle Paul was different from our work world. Uh, slaves were tools. They were owned by their masters. They were less than human, as one philosopher puts it. And in the Greek world generally, work was a curse. The citizens of Thebes were forbidden to work. Who did the work in the city of Thebes? Slaves. What did the citizens do? Friendship and politics, much like the United States in the last <laughs> month. <laughs> but in the Jewish world, work and in Canada, by the way, too, work was prized, and rabbis usually worked at a trade. Now, Paul is writing a letter to Colossae and Colossae is found just quite near the little town of Laodicea, which is the seventh of the churches to which John wrote the last book of the Bible, the book of the Revelation. And Colossae uh, was a little church threatened by brilliant and delusive preaching. It was kind of married to the age. It was a new spirituality with new freedoms, a kind of impressive asceticism, and kind of elite people. And Paul calls them here to the good news, the gospel, as it relates to slave and master. Martin Luther once said, if you preach the gospel in every respect except to the issues of your day, you have not preached the gospel at all. And here Paul is actually proclaiming the good news of Jesus to one of the issues of his day, which was work, and particularly the relationships of masters and slaves. And behind the letter is Philemon, who was a slave owner, whose slave, Onesimus, had run away, had come to Rome, had met Paul, become a Christian, and now Paul, in the little letter to Philemon, is sending him back, not just as a slave returned to his master, but as a brother. And in Colossians 3, 22 to 4, 1, when Paul is speaking to the slaves, he says, obey your master 
and not just with eye service, but from the heart or from the soul, and do so with sincerity and reverence. Two times he says, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. Who are, who's their boss? And he says you will be rewarded, if not in this life, in the next. And don't expect favoritism from a Christian master. Now, Dick Lucas, I think, so rightly says that everything the slave now does is part of his new work for the Lord. From his miserable servitude, he has been rescued at a stroke to become, yes, a full-time servant, a full-time minister of Christ. Then he turns to the masters and he says, provide what is right and fair. And remember that you have a master in heaven. You're serving Christ too, which means the slave and the master are equals. They're both servants. And Lucas adds to this, a new spirit was being loosed in Roman society that could not be contained in the old forms. Sadly, it took some 19th centuries for slavery to be abolished, and it's not finished being abolished. But still, it was a new spirit that was released. What this means, and looking particularly at verse 22, he says, you are to work, and this applies to us. Remember Martin Luther's saying, unless you've heard the gospel in terms of your own life and the issues of the day, you haven't heard good news. And here, in speaking about work, he says they are to work with reverence for the Lord, literally worshiping the Lord. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. He says that twice in the passage. So this means that people working in the world are actually doing the Lord's work. Sometimes when people tell me, I'm going to leave business and go into the Lord's work, I say, what were you doing before? <laughs> it's okay if God so leads you from one kind of Lord's work to another kind of Lord's work. But don't say you're going from secular work to the Lord's work. The Bible actually amazingly opens with a picture of God at work, the very first verse of Genesis. And so, David Jensen says, God doesn't sit enthroned in heaven, um, removed from work, willing things into existence by divine fiat. Unlike the gods of the Greco-Roman mythologies who absolved themselves from work, dining on nectar and ambrosia and uh, wonderful coffee from Richland, <laughs> in heavenly rest and contemplation, the biblical God works. So I mentioned yesterday that I had spent a summer reading through the entire Bible, underlining every word that described God working. And it was amazing. I'm just summarizing here a few of it. But he communicates, he organizes, he beautifies, he helps, he heals, he saves, he, he mediates, he rescues. Uh, it's just fantastic. God is still working, as we read in the Gospel passage, and Jesus said, I'm working too. The Bible actually describes for us a lot of people working and doing the Lord's work. We have a livestock breeder in Jacob. We have a futures trader on the grain market, Joseph, in Egypt. We have a silversmith in Bezalel, Exodus 31. We have a project manager, and that's Nehemiah. We have a wine taster in Nehemiah. We have a dumpster dipper in Ruth the Gleaner. We have an orchardist, this is good for Columbia River. We have an orchardist in Amos. We have a bureaucrat in Daniel. We have a politician in David. We have a mobile home manufacturer in Aquila and Priscilla. We have an agent for the IRA. In Canada, we call it the federal, uh, what is it? Well, whatever it is, you know what it is. <laughs> They're after our money. But we have that in Zacchaeus the tax collector, and we have a craftsperson in Dorcas, and we have a textile merchant in Lydia, who is also, by the way, the first woman pastor 
and the first pastor of the first church in Europe. Very interesting. But the Bible also reveals that God invites human beings to be his co-workers with God. With God, we're working. Genesis 1, 26, 28, and 1 Corinthians 3, 9, where you have that beautiful phrase, we are God's co-workers. And so yesterday we explored just for a moment, and I'm sorry for the repeat, but we explored how God is a creator inventing new things, and he is just as creative today as when he started to make this five billion light year universe. But he keeps everything running. You couldn't breathe another breath if he did not sustain the universe. And what happens if he were to turn off gravity? We'd be floating around like in a spaceship. And then uh, he sustains patterns of time and weather and climate, and he sustains the universe, and he sustains life systems. But God is also a savior and a redeemer. He mends and transforms and fixes things, all kinds of things, including people. And he rescues and redeems the lost. He saves the whole person. He mends broken hearts and he liberates people from bondage and he brings justice and Sabbath rest. But God is also a consummator bringing the whole story to a human uh, and wonderful end with the glorious second coming of Jesus and the transformation of everything and the full inauguration of a renewed heaven and a renewed earth. So one of the things we did explore yesterday was how people in all kinds of occupations are entering into the Lord's work, business and art, entering into God's ongoing creativity, homemakers, service roles, and politicians entering into God's sustaining work, and people in law and medicine and pastors and technicians entering into God's redeeming work, and folks that are in journalism and the media, pastors and parents and educators in consummating work, and you and the people in your church. Now, some of you are probably retired and saying, well, I don't work anymore, but you do. You do. In fact, my brother, when he retired, he did re retire at 55. He was uh, with IBM, and he said, I just can't keep up with the young men and the young women in their technology. And uh, it's a very difficult field uh, to be in, I think, as you're getting quite older. But he, he said, you know, I, didn't, I don't know how, how I had time to go to work before. <laughs> so it, it's quite possible to keep working even if you're not remunerated for it. This is a picture of a chap in China who is working. I have a student who actually audits the factories where much of the Walmart goods are actually made. Some of the goods that are in Walmart at least are made. Interestingly, he said he was doing an audit, but to see what the working conditions were, he said, when the man saw me with the camera, he put on his glasses, his mask, and his hat. <laughs> Uh, but this is a friend of mine who does have an investment business, and it's a virtual company. It's kind of the shape of some things to come, which is he's got employees in several continents, and nobody actually lives where he works, but it is a company. And I'm sorry to say this is the story for a lot of people today in the oil industry and in all kinds of really difficult jobs. Uh, this, by the way, is the cover of a book with a great title, How to Tell When You're Tired. <laughs> what, what better cover could you have for a book entitled that? So Paul is saying here, you are to work with reverence for the Lord, literally worshiping the Lord. It is the Lord Christ that you are serving. But it means further that people are working in the Lord for Jesus, and they can actually please him in their work. You can actually please God in your work. Whether it's remunerated or not does not mean anything. And I think this means there is no hierarchy of occupations with respect to pleasing God and doing the Lord's work. I told you about how I became a Christian because of that faulty idea which that pastor had, that the highest possible thing to do was to be a missionary, and if you can't do that, then you'll have to be second class, a pastor, 
And if you can't do that, well, you might be in business or something else. In fact, in most of the Christian world, the missionary is the top dog. That's the best thing you can do to please God, especially if you get sick, and I got sick as a missionary. But if you can't be a missionary, be a pastor. If you can't be a pastor, be a youth worker. If you can't be a youth worker, then do something for people, like being a doctor or a lawyer or some kind of health professional. But if you can't do that, then try homemaking. Now, in different cultures, homemaking will be higher and lower, okay? And then I became a carpenter after being a pastor. And people said, oh, you've left the ministry. I said, no, I haven't left the ministry. But they saw me with my nail belt, and I was hammering and building houses and renovating. I found, interestingly, that carpentry and the building trade was physically dirty, but morally clean. And then I went into business, which I found was physically clean. <laughs> and then there's politics. Uh, you know, uh, depending where you are. Again, in the old Greek world, it was pretty near the top, but uh, it's not too near the top, I think, in most of our world. And then marginal occupations like being stockbrokers and so on. And a very few in the Bible, I think only three jobs that are actually prohibited in the Bible. So William Tyndale got killed for saying this, so please don't do it, okay? I want to see my wife later tonight. But he said, there's no work better than another to please God. He said, to wash dishes, to preach, it's all one. That's touching the deed to please God. To be a cobbler or to be an apostle, all one. That's touching the deed to please God. So this means, with sincerity of heart, uh, secondly, the first part of the text is we have reverence for the Lord. We're doing the Lord's work, and we can please God in what we do. It doesn't matter whether you're earning money with it, but you can please God with that meal you're making today or that deal you're going to make tomorrow. But the second part of the verse is with sincerity of heart. And this is, if you like, the first part was the vertical. It's our relationship with God in our work life. <laughs> And uh, most of us spend somewhere between 40 and 80 hours a week working, okay? Maybe less, maybe more. But this part now deals with the horizontal, with sincerity of heart. That is in relationship to your boss, to your master, to the other colleagues, and so on. And what Paul says here is really significant. He says, do it from the heart, like get into it. I ask frequently CEOs of uh, businesses who are Christians, I ask them, uh, do you find that your Christian employees are good workers? I wish I didn't have to say this. He said, generally, they're not. They don't get into their work. They're more interested in getting out to a Bible study in the church or a small group. So Paul is saying here, get into it. Uh, put your heart into it and not with eye service. I mentioned my dad became a president of a company, and I worked in that company in the tool room, in the punch presses, and the warehouse, and so on. But I noticed when I was out the back, my dad would always do a walk around every day and talk to every employee. How's your wife? I know she was sick yesterday, so on. And as uh, soon as he got out of the office, everybody became very busy. They were really industrious. And then as soon as the door shut and he was back in the office, they pull out their Coca-Colas and Playboy magazines, and they relaxed. Uh, but it, Paul says, not just when your master's eye is on you. There's a beautiful Greek word for this, ophthalmic, from which we get the English word ophthalmologist. Not just with eye service, but from the heart. And don't seek favoritism from a Christian boss. And ultimately... And I don't understand this part of the verse fully, but ultimately you will be rewarded if not in this life. So what are the biggest problems of Christians in the workplace? Sometimes, not always, sometimes they don't get into their work. And they don't think their work has intrinsic value. Yes, preaching has intrinsic value. Being a pastor has intrinsic value, but 
making invoices and baking bread and uh, helping people as in a service role as a as a waitress in a restaurant that has no intrinsic value it only has extrinsic value you know saint augustine was criticized for buying his sandals from a non-christian sandal maker and the christians criticized him and said you should be buying your sandals from a christian sandal maker he said something devastating he said i do too much walking to walk on inferior sandals. Oh. So we can be exemplary in the way we work and be a testimony to God. Don't think that your work uh, in this world isn't going to last. It is going to last if by faith, hope, and love. There's two ways we look at work. One is extrinsic value, which means it leads to pay. It leads to a provision. It leads perhaps to prestige and maybe in some countries a platform for mission. But the intrinsic value means it's good in itself. It's pleasing to God. It serves God's purposes. And so we think so often that secular work, so-called, has extrinsic value but not intrinsic value. But Christian work, like being an evangelist, a pastor, a, a missionary, that work has both extrinsic as well as intrinsic value. But actually, all good work has both extrinsic and intrinsic value. So Paul is here saying, with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Martin Luther said, the idea that service to God should have only to do with the church altar, singing, reading, sacrifice, and the like, is without doubt the worst trick of the devil. How could the devil have led us more effectively astray than by the narrow conception that service to God takes place only in church and by works done therein. The whole world could abound with services to the Lord, not only in churches, but also in the home, kitchen, workshop, and field. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, thank you so much for this inseminating word that speaks life to us in an area of our life where we all do work. And so please, dear God, may we be able to be able to work with sincerity of heart and reverence for you and to please you in our entire being so that when people are watching us and working with us, they may even be invited to say, what does make you tick? And we can tell them, it's you, Lord. You are so good and so beautiful. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.